February 7th, 2021, what the church calendar tells us is the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany, or as our country tells us, is Super Sunday, uh, because of the beginning later on, later on. We're good to have everybody with us this morning as we worship our risen Lord and, and Savior together. I have just a few announcements that I'd like to make uh, at this time. We're continuing on with our James Devotion Series. Again, it's Monday through Saturday, 10 o'clock, on our church Facebook page, also over on my YouTube channel, where we're walking through uh, James. We'll start session number 31 tomorrow. We're having 40 sessions total, so we're continuing uh, to do that. Uh, one new thing we're going to start this Wednesday, and you may have seen the video on our Facebook page, uh, is uh, an hashtag campaign. Uh, social media, we do hashtags, try and group certain posts together. I we'll thought, well, that's Wednesday coming. Let's do an hashtag campaign in which I want to hear from you. What questions do you have about Ash Wednesday, Lent, what's Maldi Thursday? Not yet, not yet. <laughs> what I want you to do is I want you to email them, call and ask them, text them to me, what have you. And then starting Wednesday, I'm going to take a couple of the questions and I'm going to try and answer them to the best of, of my ability. And I hope it's a way for us to maybe kind of learn a little bit about uh, this particular church uh, season and have a little fun with it as well. So don't be hashtag. It will start Wednesday on Facebook. It will pop up every now and then. But hopefully we can come to some uh, better understanding about what this season is about. Speaking of which, there will be an Ash Wednesday service here at 7 o'clock for everybody that wants to attend. We'll have a service. We'll sing a couple of hymns. Uh, we'll have the imposition of, of, of the ashes. Uh, if you are uncomfortable coming, then we're also going to have ashes available next Sunday in a little to-go container. So you can watch the service at home if you would rather, and then also make the mark of the ashes on your forehead at home if you would wish. So that will be here uh, next week. And the day before that, which is Shrove Tuesday, sometimes called Fat Tuesday, uh, our youth are going to have a fundraiser, so pancake soap. And so just like we've been doing with our spaghetti meals and the Lumen Lumen's group meals, it'll be drive through Just simply pull up. How many plates do you want? We'll give you how many plates you want. We'll have pancakes and bacon, that kind of thing. It's all free, but if you want to make a donation for the youth group, then that'll be the time to do that as well. So that's pretty much it. Got a busy couple of weeks uh, coming up as we head towards Ash Wednesday and Lent. But to get our hearts and minds in a proper posture for this Sunday, I want to turn things over to Sunday.
You are the one who called this world into being, and we acknowledge that you have no equal in the extent of your power. Yet you want to share your power, your strength, with those who are powerless. You ache to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up the wounds of the lost and rejected folk of this world. Such radical love leaves us speechless, but you gave it human form and shape in the person of Jesus, in whom your promises of healing and empowerment were fulfilled. We give you thanks and praise for blessing our lives in this way, and we pray that in Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we too can become radical lovers of the powerless and passionate bearers of hope to those whose lives are filled with despair and hopelessness. May this time of worship be a true expression of our desire to praise and glorify you, O God, for the many ways in which you bless us. And may our lives reveal our gratitude in all we think and do and say. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Through Jesus, you opened the eyes of the blind, you healed the sick, and you fed the hungry. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. Loving Father, by the Spirit, you restore strength to the weary and give hope to those who are in despair. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. You call us, Lord, to proclaim your deeds and your wonders to all people. You call us to worship and serve you, that all may be made whole. You offer us a new life of righteousness. We give you thanks and praise for your mercy and your love. Make us worthy, O Lord, to receive all your gifts. Send on us like the light of the day, to give light to our souls, and put your praise upon our lips. Amen. Well, as we come now to our first reading of Scripture for this Sunday morning, and we await with joyous anticipation what the Lord would have revealed to us through His written Word, I'd like to invite you to join me as we pray together our prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading for this morning comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll take a look at verses 16 through 23. So again, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. The Apostle Paul writes these words. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. But though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessing. Friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks to God. That brings us to our time of confession before God and, and one another. We'll, we'll talk a little more about repentance and confession when we get to the sermon. But as we do each week, I do encourage you to, to be honest during this time of worship. That you reflect on the past week and acknowledge that there are things that you shouldn't have said or thought or did. All of us are tempted in some way. All of us fall in some way. But one of our duties as Christ's followers is to acknowledge our faults, our warts, if you will, bringing those to the Lord and seeking His forgiveness. Because yes, our Lord is just, but also personal, ready and willing to forgive us all of our sins, so we just simply come to Him with an honest and contrite heart. So friends, we'll all pray together in prayer of confession now, first in silence. Let us pray.
most merciful God. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I want you to hear this message that God loves us so much that he sent his only son to die the death that we deserve. He saved us while we were yet sinners. This proves just how much our Creator cares for us. And so, friends, in the name of Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is from the Gospel of St. Mark. The first chapter. We'll take a look at verses 29 through 39. So again, this is Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. And it says this. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him, him is Jesus, about her at once. He, Jesus, came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. Friends, again, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. I want to, um, as we begin, encourage anyone and everyone with a cell phone or a tablet or what have you to make sure that you have downloaded the YouVersion Bible app on your phone or your tablet. You probably already have it on there, and I encourage you to take a look at it. Because it contains a wealth of information for us as Christ followers. Bible studies, devotions, verse of the day, picture of the day, a place for prayer. And since most of us spend our days tethered to the thing anyway, why not put it to good use? I know I've used it before with the youth group. I've been in Bible studies with some of the men in here. I've used it on my own, my own personal walk with the Lord. But I say that simply to mention that I finished one such devotion this week, and it was called Win the Day. Win the Day. It was a seven-day series that has, as its stated goal, ways for us to be able to make sure that each 24-hour day is lived as both the first and the last days of our lives. To not look back and dwell upon the past. Go to look far in the future to the uncertainties that it holds. But instead, use the 24 hours you're given each day to live the abundant life that God calls us to live. Each day had a different theme. And the theme for this past Monday was Eat the Frog. Eat the Frog. And here's how that devotion began for that day. It says, according to Mark Twain, if you ever have to eat a live frog, it's best done first thing in the morning. 
I know this scenario is often unlikely, but it's a good, but it's good advice nonetheless. Why eat the lives wrong first thing in the morning, you ask? Because then you can go through the rest of your day knowing that the hardest task is behind you. <laughs> the devotion went on to say that we need to get in the habit of doing the hardest thing for us to do, whatever it may be, first thing in the morning. What is it that you dread doing? What is it that you don't want to do, even though you know you must do it? The devotion urged us to set up disciplines and habits that set the tone first thing in the morning. Make the most of the earliest first part of the day to do the hardest thing there is for you to do. Which got me to think. What about the hard things for us to do as Christ followers? What is a hard thing for us to do? What's the frog being to think about eating in the morning? Is it finding time for prayer? Is it finding time to get into the Word? Is it finding the right translation that you're going to be able to, to get through to help it make sense? Is it finding a small group? Is it staying away from my sermon? <laughs> While I agree that all these things may be difficult at one point or another, what I think is the hardest thing for us to do, regardless of where you are in your journey with the Lord, is for us to come to some kind of a clear understanding of exactly who Jesus is and what his message for us truly is. Because I think the hardest thing for us to do as Christians is to allow Jesus to come out of that box that we invariably all try to put him in. We need to allow Jesus to do what Jesus came to do where it is that Jesus came to do it. Or to put it another way, we need to stop trying to make Jesus do only what we want him to do. And only doing it where we want him to do it. After all, that's what the lesson of today's passage is all about. Our lesson this morning takes place on the exact same day that last week's passage took place when Jesus threw out the unclean spirit in the synagogue. The exact same day. What we see is that service is now ended, and Jesus and the disciples are going to go for their after-church meal. And since there was no three amigos or bands or top side for them to choose from, they go to Peter's house. Now I realize he's called Simon in our story, but this is, this is Peter. And it's funny to me that it says, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew, because the house was literally right across the street from the synagogue. This is one of the sites that we visited when I went to the Holy Land in 2017. And the place that they have excavated that they say was a synagogue, and the place that they have excavated they say was Peter's house, I kid you not, there's no further than from here to the front door of the church. Literally right across the street. Anyway, Jesus and the disciples go to Peter's house. And who can tell me how many disciples there were at this time? The four. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. The rest of the crew had not build out yet. So if you ever started to think, how do we really get so many people into Peter's house? There was only four disciples. Right? Well, there wasn't many disciples. But they enter the house, and Peter and Andrew tell Jesus that Peter's mother-in-law has a fever. Don't say big deal, fever. Well, back then, a fever was a very big deal. In fact, this fever was so bad, it caused Peter's mother-in-law to become bedridden. And then Jesus Without even being asked, it seems, goes right to her and takes her by the hand, lifts her up, and she is healed completely. As you would expect in such a small town, Capernaum, word spreads pretty fast. Next thing you know, the whole city is there, outside of Peter's house. And Jesus is healing people of various diseases and casting out all kinds of demons. And the next day, Peter gets up and he needs to go find Jesus. Because they'll be there's now a line starting to form outside of Peter's door again. We're not told exactly why everybody was looking for Jesus, but they're looking for Jesus. So they go try to find him. And they find him out of the wilderness, and he's praying. Now, in Peter's mind, what Jesus needs to be doing is heading back to the house and doing some more healing and some more exorcism. 
That's what he says, Jesus needs to be doing. Jesus said, no. You don't need to go back. What we need to be doing is going to other towns and proclaiming the message that I was sent to proclaim. And what is that message? We'll get to that in a minute. But the question as we start to think about it is, where do you like your Jesus? Where is your preferred place to experience the risen Christ? Because if you take last week's story of the healing in the synagogue, and you put it side by side with today's story of the healing in Peter's house, you have a pretty stark distinction. The miracle last week was in public, or was in a sacred place. This week's healing was in private, and in a home. Last week, the miracle had Jesus speaking. This week, the miracle, Jesus remains silent. Last week, Jesus was commanding unclean spirits from a distance. This week, he's performing his miracles with a human touch. Where do you like with Jesus? In church? On Sunday morning? With a group of people? Out in public? Hearing Jesus speak to everyone through the word being proclaimed from the pulpit? Or in private? At any given moment? Up close and personal, face to face, healing him, healing us without him having to say a word. I think we're being honest. We may prefer the arm's length Jesus as opposed to the all of in my business Jesus. But friends, that's exactly the kind of Jesus that we need. Because that is why Jesus came. He says he came to proclaim the message. Right here in verse 38 39. Verse 38 says, I came to do this. Verse 39 says, I did it. The healings and the miracles, yes, they're important. What they do is give validity to his status as the Son of God, but also give weight to his message. And that message, that's in verse 14 of the same chapter. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. We can see from our story that Jesus considers this to be the most important part of his earthly ministry. The preaching and the teaching of this message. Repent and believe the good news. We hear that so often that I worry that maybe it's lost some of its meaning on. I mean, we readily accept the challenge to believe the good news, do we not? And we should. Because there's no better news for us than that which we call the good news. We were dead in our trespass and sin. Religion couldn't help us. New resolutions couldn't change us. Then Jesus, the baby born of a virgin in Bethlehem, comes as the Son of God. He did what we couldn't do. He lived a righteous life before God. It pleased God. And yet he still was crucified on a cross under the curse of sin. He did that for us. He died in our place. But Jesus was raised from the grave to offer all of us new life through the Spirit. Jesus gives us new life to all who call upon him in faith. The beauty of the gospel message is that those of us who trust in Jesus never again have to fear any kind of alienation from God. In Christ, you are secure. In Christ, you are loved. In Christ, you are whole. In Christ, you are chosen. In Christ, you are pure. That's the good news. And we have no trouble, at least I hope we don't, in believing the good news. But that's part two. You remember what part one was? Repent. That's the hard thing. That's the hard thing. That's the frog we need to eat every morning. But it's the necessary thing. In fact, I think that, that repentance makes us appreciate the good news even more. But that doesn't mean it's easy. I mean, we have a we have a hard time, I think, allowing Jesus in, allowing Jesus to get up close and personal with us. Now, I think it's easy for us to gather in worship 
and together to pray a prayer of confession together, surrounded by others listening to me say the words. Easy to look around the sanctuary and maybe think to ourselves, well, I know what she needs to repent of. <laughs> or he better be seeking forgiveness for what I heard about him. It's a little bit different, though, to turn that gaze inward, isn't it? It's a little bit different to open the door and let Jesus in. Just you and him. Letting him take you by the hand. Letting him lift you up. Letting him heal you. That healing comes by way of confession of your sins and repentance of them. Honestly, earnestly, completely. But it's hard. We'd rather not do it. We'd rather not admit those things and acts and thoughts we have to separate us from God. And then there's also this question. If we're justified by faith and forgiven all our sins, past, present, and future, then why is it necessary to continue seeking forgiveness? Aren't our sins already forgiven? Why do we have to keep seeking forgiveness and doing it over and over and over. You ever thought about that? It's because, friends, as we live our lives, and unfortunately sin, which we do, we need to return over and over again to God in repentance and faith, seeking His forgiveness. We do so based upon the basis of Christ's work. Apply to us in our justification. Remember, justification is simply being forgiven of our sins and now living a new life in Christ. But when we come to the Lord time and again seeking forgiveness, repenting of our sins, it's not so we can experience a new justification. It's simply a renewed application of our initial justification. When we sin, we lose our consciousness of forgiveness and our sense of peace with God. So when we confess our sins by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are reawakened to what Christ has done for us. God revives our security in Him, and He restores the assurance of our salvation. Friends, we should continue to pray daily for forgiveness, not because we're worried we may not be saved, but simply because we can have the confidence of adopted and beloved children Approaching a heavenly Father who has declared us just in Christ. Daily repentance draws us closer and closer to our Lord and makes the good news sweeter and sweeter. If you've been with us during our James Devotion series we're doing every day, there's a part every time when we pray a prayer of repentance. And I don't dare speak for everybody who's been joining us each day, but I know that for me personally, that prayer is a time of peace. And not angst. A time of thanksgiving and not shame. A time of appreciation and not despair. I mean, think of it this way. I was lucky enough to coach the middle school cross country team this past season. The very first practice, I told them this is not something about just running. You have to have proper form and proper technique. You have to do the right kind of breathing. You have to listen to our bodies to be able to set the right pace for ourselves. We have to know just how much we can save the reserve so at the end of the race we can push ourselves and finish strong. We have to eat right. We have to run on our own when we don't have practice on the weekend. We had about two weeks before our first meet. We got through the first meet and we did pretty good. But what if after that first meet, we simply stopped running? We didn't have any other practices. We didn't participate in any other meets, and we simply showed up two, two months later to the final conference championships meet. How will we have done? Terrible. It's like, it's why you practice. It's why you work day after day because you want to be in a constant state of readiness. You do the same things over and over and over again so that when the time comes, you're ready. Yes, it was hard work. Those young people. But by the time the conference championships came, because we did it day after day after day after day, they were ready. You got a big old trophy to prove it, too. But friends, we must also do the hard work to 
to stand ready for the day when Christ returns. Yes, through your faith in Christ, as your Savior, you are saved. But friends, that does not excuse you from the hard work of repentance. Every day, friends, every day we will be tempted and we will fail more days than not. Every day is a day for us to repent of something. We can't skip it. Because if we do, what you will find is that you are walking further and further away from the Lord your God. We need to begin each day with a prayer. And here's one that I found that might be helpful. You may have seen it online. It says, Dear Lord, so far I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. <laughs> and from then on, I'm going to need a lot more help. <laughs> Do the hard work, friend. Be in a constant state of readiness. Repent and believe the good news. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we know that becoming all things to all people, that the Apostle Paul spoke about earlier, doesn't mean selling out, being hypocrites, or lying. It means understanding other people so well that we know the best word or action that might lead them one step closer to trusting and loving Jesus. Give us that kind of sympathy and wisdom so that by all means some may come to faith in Him. Renew and strengthen your church. Grant means to His word so that hearts are touched by the gospel of salvation. Make it swift to speak and enact forgiveness and mercy in your name. Make it tireless in bearing witness to you Conform it to your will. Use it to draw all people to yourself. Renew and strengthen all who suffer for the sake of Jesus. Help them to constantly trust in his love. Help us who do not experience such suffering to pray for them, defend them, provide for them as we are able, and to live in a way that glorifies you and honors their witness. Renew and strengthen this congregation. Give us confidence to willingly wait upon you for guidance and to gladly obey what you command. Use us to encourage our families, friends, and neighbors, especially those who most need to know your love. Renew and strengthen your servants who are nearing or are in retirement. Fill them with your spirit so that they may continue to walk tirelessly in the way of faithfulness and service which you set before them. Renew and strengthen the leaders of nations. Grant them wisdom and understanding, counsel and light, knowledge and fear of the Lord. Renew and strengthen all who work to bring us justice, safety, and healing in these troubled times. Grant them courage and integrity and use their labors to accomplish your will. Renew and strengthen all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those names we bring to you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Give them hope to wait upon your gifts of health and wholeness. Give them faith to rise above doubt, despair, and sorrow. Give them your love shared for each of us to strengthen and shield and surround them always. Most blessed and gracious Lord, thank you for the great and final healing you bestow upon all who died clean to your promises. 
Grant us all joy and sorrow, patience and suffering, courage and danger, wisdom and choosing, compassion and mercy and service. Graciously hear and generously answer our prayers and petitions, dear Father, as may be best for us and to your greater glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, now will be the time we normally pass our offering plates throughout our sanctuary. We're not doing that just yet in this season of church life together. I do want to say a prayer in appreciation of your continued and faithful giving and in anticipation of your future giving. So let's now say a prayer over our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. God of grace and mercy, you are the source of the true healing that can make us whole. We remember this morning that Jesus' ministry was deeply involved in both healing of people's bodies and healing of relationships. As we take time now in worship to offer our gifts to you, we pray that they might be used to bring healing of body, of spirit, of broken relationships to people who are in desperate need. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Being that it is the first Sunday of the month, we get to share in Holy Communion with one another. As has been our practice over the past several months, I'll go through the Communion Liturgy for everybody. And then Mike and I will come by with the, the plates and we invite you to take one of our prepackaged uh, wafer and juice that we have uh, for you. But then hold on to it, because we're going to take them all together. I do remember this is the one that's got the juice on one end and the wafer on the opposite end. So do the wafer first. Right? Or else we right again. To <laughs> make a mess. So friends, I invite you to join me in whatever posture of prayer you find uh, most reverent for this time as we go through our communion liturgy together. We lift up our hearts and give thanks to you, God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and all these gifts, that in the breaking of the bread and drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, <clears throat> redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at your heavenly table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now. Brothers and sisters, as the reconciled and forgiven sons and daughters of the Most High, I want to invite you to join me as we say together our family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our
body of a sinless man broken so that you and I who are broken can become sinners. The cup of salvation which we give thanks is the blood of our Savior Christ Jesus poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of all of our sins. So friends, yes, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed. being sent into a world in need of healing. We have been given all that we need to be God's messengers of peace. Go now to the world, rejoicing in God's presence with you. Bring the news of peace and hope to all you meet. Amen.